Welcome, everyone. Welcome, friends, to our final Funding Fridays webinar of the 2020-2021 academic year. Um, and today we're going to be discussing how to effectively share and promote your scholarly and creative work online with our very own scholarly communications librarian, Meg Wacha. So um, this webinar series, for those of you who hadn't attended, um, is a very welcome collaboration between the Office of Research, which, and I always forget to introduce myself, I am Effie McLaughlin. <laughs> I am the Assistant University Dean for Research in the Office of Research. I've been in the Office of Research for about 10 years now, and I direct uh, most of the internal funding programs and also the research development programming. And I am here with my colleague, Remy Dar, who's also going to um, who's a program coordinator in the Office of Research, and she's going to help me um, monitor the chat and keep time. Um, so it's a collaboration between the Office of Research, the Research Foundation Office of Award Pre-Proposal Support, or RF Apps, and the CUNY Office of Library Services, which is why we are speaking with Meg here today, which has been a really wonderful collaboration over the course of this year. Um, and the Funding Fridays webinar was launched this past fall by our um, still fairly new Associate Vice Chancellor, Tamara Schneider, as a way to provide um, you know, sort of targeted research development support for faculty as we, you know, navigate this new reality of ours. Um, so the goal of this webinar is to create a living resource for research development support and information for researchers at all levels and in all uh, circumstances, all situatednesses uh, across the university. Um, the webinar is being recorded and made available online on the Office of Research website. So please, um, I guess Megan was going to put that we have a little consent slide, but um, please know that this webinar is being recorded. So if you're not comfortable having your um, image on screen, please keep your camera off. So I am amazed that we are nearing the end of our season this year. Um, but please stay tuned. We are, um, we're gonna be sending out an invitation very soon. We're doing a more intensive um, series of NIH grant writing workshops with um, Michelle Keeley, who is the Associate Dean for Research at the School of Public Health. And we're gonna do that in July, a series of three workshops. And we're gonna be sending out the promotions for that soon. So if you are anyone that writes NIH grants, you should certainly look into that. Um, and also, please reach out to me if any of you have any ideas for um, subjects that you would like to have addressed in these Funding Fridays webinars. We already have a few topics um, queued up for our fall and spring season next year, but please do reach out to me at any point. So just finally, the housekeeping. Um, this, the presentation is going to be about 45 minutes, I believe, if I'm correct, Meg. And then we always try to leave lots of time at the end for question and answers. But also, as Megan said, it looks like it's going to be a little bit of a smaller group today. But um, Megan is a very uh, affable and congenial host. So if any of you has burning questions, we can, um, in the middle, um, you can, we can try to answer them as we go along. But probably it would be easiest if we wait until the end. But we will try to, Remy and I are going to monitor the chat, and we will get to at all or as many of your questions as we can. Um, so let me, I feel like uh, Meg doesn't require any introduction because this is actually the third Funding Fridays presentation that they've done. So, but, um, so as I said, Meg is the scholarly communications library, librarian in the Office of Library Services. Uh, Meg leads the development and management of CUNY Academic Works, which maybe some of you are familiar with and she'll probably be talking about today. Uh, they train faculty and staff about the scholarly publishing landscape, including author's rights, open access publishing, which is probably of interest to many of you, and also alternative publishing trends. Um, they're also the, they serve as the primary resource on copyright compliance, fair use, and other issues of copyright for the Office of Library Services. So she has, they have a ton of experience and um, knowledge about all aspects of this. So um, without any further ado, Megan, please take it away. Thanks so much, Effie. I can't believe this is our last Funding Friday of the, of the season. Um, you know, thank you so much to everyone uh, for joining us. This has really been such an incredible, um, I'd like to think, uh, kind of fun collaboration um, to have this year. And I'm so incredibly thankful both to Effie and to Remy uh, for all of their work in organizing and uh, making sure that we can be in a virtual room together today. Um, so today, uh, we are going to talk about boosting your scholarly profile online, uh, or as my former uh, CUNY colleague, 
Robin Davis says, uh, embracing what happened? the Hi, if everyone could please turn their, their their microphones off, I can probably do it, but please make sure your microphone's off. Thank you. Great, thanks folks. Um, uh, let's see, so my, my a former CUNY colleague of mine, Robin Davis, uh, used to refer the, to this as um, embracing the internet as your business card. Um, and so I really do mean that, right? Business cards uh, were once our way, our primary way to exchange contact information, remember other people and make an impression. And the internet can do all of those things for you as well. Um, here's, the, here's the slide. Um, so as Effie said, um, today's conversation is being recorded. Um, but if you have any questions or input, um, do feel free to chat me privately if you're not comfortable um, saying it out loud and I can anonymously relay it to the group. Um, so this is very much uh, for you today. Um, and in support of that, uh, my primary goal um, is really to improve the likelihood that your scholarship is discovered by researchers in your discipline and related fields, as well as stakeholders such as the press, funding agencies, right? All of whom will lead to continued growth of your research and prestige. So we are going to discuss uh, three tools that were selected in order to provide you with a higher profile on the web and then take a deeper look at your research impact. Um, in order to raise one's profile, there are really four things that every researcher can do. Um, you can improve the discoverability of your research, share and promote it online, participate in conversations uh, via social media or professional blogs, and then measure the impact of your scholarly works. And so the tools that we'll be talking about today will really focus on those first two with a nod towards the fourth. Um, we'll stay away from Facebook and Twitter threads for the purposes of today. <laughs> Um, now, some of you may already be working with one of these services, um, so I'm really going to try, to try to provide you with some more background about their utility within this specific context, um, and then how they can work together as well. So, and I, this really is a question, um, and please feel free to put your answer in the chat. When was the last time that you Googled yourself? And the chat, I believe, is not included in the recording, so please uh, feel free to pop that in. Great, so I'm seeing last week, a few days ago, a month ago, maybe last year, earlier this year. Looks like one month seems to be a pretty good thing. Um, first time ever and last time two weeks ago. I know it can sometimes be a little scary what we see there. Um, five years ago. Great, this is great, right? So we see really a full range. Um, and I will admit that I'm sometimes a little shy about uh, confessing to the vanity search. It can really feel um, like that, like, like vanity. Um, but it's actually one of the most important things that you can do um, in boosting your profile. When someone reads a paper you just published, when you're speaking at an event, or when someone is thinking of inviting you to give a presentation, or maybe someone's trying to remember who you are and you know, what the focus of your work is. Um, maybe you're applying for a job or tenure, right? All of these different reasons, people are Googling you. So it's really important for you to see what they see, right? So this is like a good practice. And when you conduct that, um, that Google search, you know, what do you see? Um, does your name appear in the results list? Are there individuals with similar names? Um, how might you differentiate your name from someone who you know, has something similar or maybe even the same? Um, you know, does it yield information that you don't want others to see? Um, well, there are some things that you can do to address these issues, right? Um, you know, you can change your name on your Amazon wish list from the name you use on your publications to, um, you know, something something different. Um, but what about those rate my professor comments? When I offer these workshops in person, I hear a lot about the rate my professor comments, and that makes sense. They show up really high in those search results, and they tend to reflect the top and the bottom of you know a student's experiences. 
or perceived experiences. Um, those unfortunately aren't going to be removed um, except under extraordinary circumstances. And you can't really go in and change to a pseudonym. So in this case, um, and in similar cases to it, um, we really encourage you to exercise the nuclear option and nothing short of it, um, namely to um, produce and manage content on other sites, right? To really start feeding more information about yourself to the internet so that the less than ideal material will gradually become less relevant and fall lower and lower on the search results. So you might see some things. What do you want to see? Um, well, the ideal is really to control everything on the first page of search, re search results for your name, right? So either created by you or with your permission. You want to make sure that all of the information is both current and accurate. Are the results accurate, uh, excuse me, active? In other words, if a social media account or blog comes up, right, have you posted within the last few months? Is this a place where people can still find information about what you're currently working on? Um, and does it reflect the academic persona that you want to share? And when I talk about academic personas, I really like to look at the work of um, Kim Barber and David Mar uh, Marshall. They published a study about the construction of academic online identities or persona. Um, now, they did not investigate the role of identity as a holistic ideal as individuals in this world. Um, they really focused on the constructed personas through which academics present various versions of themselves to the world, right? Um, something which is now really an essential activity. Um, there are five identities they've studied, which you know I listed here, and these slides, if you'd like to look more closely, are available, will be available on the Faculty Funding Friday website with a link to the original research study. Um, and these really range from the formal self, right, where it's really reflective of the content on your CV and your academic profile, um, to the networked self, right? You're sharing a little bit more information about your life, embracing sort of a two-way conversation to something that's totally uncontrolled. All of the pictures of your cats and your family and what you were doing with your friends on Saturday afternoon, right? Um, and so an important question to ask yourself is to what extent do you want your personal life and professional life to be separate or combined in the representation online, right? And what of these personas do you choose to use to um, present yourself, right? So really being intentional about what we put out into this world. Now, um, I conducted that Google search of myself um, and there were some initial questions that I had, right? Is there information missing about my professional activities? Some, there's, there's uh, some growth for me to work on. I do a lot of work in Wikipedia and, um, and that needs to be there. Um, do they accurately reflect, reflect all of the work that I'm doing? Um, could a potential employer, I'm never leaving cutie, but could a potential employer or collabor uh, collaborator uh, ascertain my discipline, right? Or my research area if we wanted to work with each other? Um, what social networking sites am I on, right? Is it something that I can really maintain? Um, now, one of the things that's great about these results is that, that I have my academic commons profile up at the top, right? So people can find my email, right? They can read more information about my research. Um, I used to have a personal website. And if you have the time to maintain a personal website, that is great. Um, but realistically, I had one and then I didn't keep it up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest here. Um, so by not keeping it up, it wasn't really benefiting my career. Um, and so I made the decision to close it. Um, now I can start it up again soon. I can start it up again next month, a year from now. Um, whenever I decide that I will uh, be able to focus on maintaining that content. Um, now on this list, there's one thing that I don't see that I really don't have control over, right? Everything here was created by me or I know who created it and can inform what's represented, including the photos. Um, but I don't control peoplepill.com, um, but I, do, I did take a look and I do control some of the data sources, 
right? So if I see something there that isn't accurate, I can go and kind of fix it on that original data source. I can also um, go in um, and start getting more stuff online. And I'm going to go and do that um, to make sure that people pill gets moved down in the search results for uh, more relevant ones. Okay, so what about Google Scholar, right? We've all conducted Google searches of ourselves. Have we tried that, um, that search for Google Scholar? And actually, why, if you, why don't we go and um, do that now? Um, so everybody take a moment. Megan, I, I don't know if you noticed, there was actually a question in the chat from Pat, Patrick Slattery that he says, I mean, you can read it, but he says that it brings uh, up a different scholar who's basically the antithesis of him. And how do you address that if somebody has the same name as you? Okay, this is really great. So I am, let me put a link into the chat. Um, and I'm going to ask that people uh, search themselves on Google Scholar and listen as I'm answering uh, Patrick's question. Um, Okay, so there are two things um, that you can do to distinguish yourself from other entities um, to, you know, if, if you share a name, as is the case with um, Patrick uh, Slatery, and I apologize if I'm uh, not pronouncing that correctly. One is to consistently use um, something such as a middle initial that will distinguish you between this Patrick Slatery and that Patrick Slatery. The second thing that you can do is you can use, um, uh, if you are a, a researcher and you are publishing your work, um, just as your research articles can have a unique identifier called a digital object identifier that points just to that article, not to anything else, um, you can also have a unique identifier for you. Um, and that is called an orchid, uh, not like the flower, um, uh, but O-R-C-I-D, so orc ID um, is another way that it's pronounced. Um, and that's an identifier that you can create um, for yourself that will be unique to you. And then when you publish uh, works, um, you can provide that ORCID to the publisher and they will include it on your article. And behind the scenes in, you know, the magic of machines, uh, all of your work will begin to be associated with your name um, and give you an opportunity to um, separate out your work from theirs. Um, those are the two primary things that I would suggest. There are a couple of additional ones um, that we can do um, that I'll talk about a little bit later in the webinar. Um, yeah, and it sounds like James Richardson has that same problem. Um, I am very fortunate that I have a very distinctive last name. Um, there are other Megan Watches out in the world, but they are not librarians and they do not work in my area. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it can be um, very frustrating. And so this is where orchids, middle initials, and really controlling your, um, your representation online can be very useful, getting as much information out there as possible. And one of the ways that you can do that, um, well, actually, let's take a step back. Okay, so, um, so folks are going in and talking about orchid. That's great. Um, but we've conducted a search for ourselves in Google Scholar. Is there anyone uh, who feels comfortable uh, unmuting and sharing the results? You can just raise your hand. Okay, and it looks like uh, Eric has raised his hand, or Erica, excuse me. Hi, um, sorry. It so hi, my name is Erica Richardson. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Baruch and I just searched myself on Google Scholar. Um, again, Eric Richardson's a very simple name. I actually did add in black women because that's like a focus for me. And the two things that came up were my article, um, which is not open access. Um, and then my dissertation, which is um, <laughs> available uh, through my institution and so Part of me was like quite pleased, like, oh, like, like, look, like I show up. If I just type in Eric Richardson, I have the same um, issues others were talking about where it's like a lot of 
it's just a really common name. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's a really key point and one that we're going to go into is that when people find your work, can they read your work? So it sounds like they may hit a paywall if they're trying to access the most recent research that you've published. Um, exactly. Yeah. So the way that they can find more about you know, sort of your path is through reading your dissertation, but that might not be the thing that you want them to go and read. Okay, yeah, very good. Uh, Rebecca, would you like to share as well? Thanks so much, Erica. Um, sure, yeah, I I usually use my middle initial um, mm -hmm. in my publication, but I searched it without it because I thought people might search for it without it, right? And just use it as a way to distinguish. Um, and eight of the 10 things that popped up on the page were my name. I didn't click through any of them yet to see uh, how many are open access and how many are closed. Um, my dissertation was the second thing that came up there as well. Um, yeah, there, there were things and it was me, so that's good, but my last name is not super common, um, especially in like in terms of academia, I have a big family, but they're not, <laughs> they're not in academics. So um, yeah, it seemed like it was mostly my stuff. Yeah, well, that's great. So eight out of 10 publications is very strong, right? And one of the things that I'm hearing between both what you said and what Erica said is that that dissertation is really high up there. And, you know, one can uh, sort of conjecture that the dissertation is high up there because it is openly accessible, right? When people can click on something and more and more people can click on it and spend time with it, the search engines pay more attention to it, right? And so we really want to make sure that as much as possible, our work is openly accessible online. And so the first tool that we're going to go into um, is one that can support you to do that. Um, and that is uh, our institutional repository, CUNY Academic Works, um, which you can go to at academicworks.cuny.edu. Uh, um, and CUNY Academic Works is essentially a centralized repository that is specifically dedicated to sharing and showcasing the research and creative outputs that are produced by the CUNY community. So including uh, graduate dissertations, um, for those of you who got your PhD, your doctorate at the Graduate Center, um, as well as all of the different types of outputs um, that you put into the world. Um, and the repository actually comes from uh, the CUNY University Faculty Senate and Statement, uh, excuse me, the CUNY UFS uh, Statement and Resolution on Open Access, um, which was passed in November of 2011. Um, and I always want to point to this because it's why we have a repository, right? is because this statement and resolution was passed by CUNY faculty. And so in turn, the repository was developed in service to CUNY faculty, to CUNY researchers, all of you. And it collects a wide variety of scholarly content, um, including content, I apologize for the truck outside the window, um, including content that often falls outside of traditional publication channels, right? So yes, journal articles, books, book chapters, really critical stuff. Um, but also data, uh, working papers, professional blog posts, right? Those things that you want um, to be accessible and to have a lot of eyes on it now and in the future. And there are a lot of different reasons why someone can submit to academic works, right? There is of course the social reasons um, around sharing your work, right? To make sure that those um, who perhaps are at at an institution that doesn't subscribe to particular databases or not affiliated with an institution at all, you know, don't have that experience of conducting a Google search and being asked to pay 20, 30, $40, right? Um, but also because when your work is read more, right? When people can read it, it is cited more. And this allows you to really increase your impact. Um, because by making your work publicly accessible, users can access it no matter where they're searching, right? Content um, in academic works is discoverable via the library's OneSearch, as well as through search engines such as Google, Google Scholar, Bing. Yes, people do use Bing. <laughs> um, 
you know, and unlike a personal website, Academic Works really works beautifully with Google's algorithm, um, ensuring that your work is not only visible, but in those top search results, right? Um, in fact, over 80% of the traffic that comes to the repository comes to us through search engines, right? Um, and we provide a stable URL to you so that you can easily direct readers to those works and get those clicks, right? And as I said, when your work is read more, it's cited more. It depends on the quality of the work. It depends on the discipline. But when your work is openly accessible, whether through an open access journal or an open access repository like Academic Works, it's typically cited, between, um, increases your citation rate from 200 to 600%, right? That's, that's not small. And Academic Works has tools to help you track that impact. So when you create an account with Academic Works, um, we will send you monthly readership reports that tell you how often that work has been downloaded, which can be indicative of future citations, right? You can also log in and access the author dashboard, which will give you some important information around the number of downloads. As I said, that can um, be indicative of future citations. Um, it can be helpful when you are applying to um, a granting agency, for instance, right? It's gonna take two or three years for other, you know, for that work to be published, for people to read it, to cite it, maybe four or five. Um, and you wanna show the impact of your work now, right? So you can tell them, this received 500 downloads. Um, people care about this work. Um, it will provide information about the geographic location of those downloads, but not the names of the individual users. Um, their institution, if they're logging in from their institution, how they got there. Um, and we will also give you the ability to download that content and choose to share it with your colleagues, um, for instance, as a part of your tenure packet. Um, or with other bodies as you choose. Uh, we will not share it on your behalf without your permission, right? We really protect um, privacy. Again, um, you know, developed in service to CUNY faculty. And so far, um, Academic Works now receives over a million downloads e each year. And content has been downloaded in every state and in every country. Um, I used to brag about the one download we had in Greenland, but now we've had three or four. So I'm very excited about those. <laughs> um, now, many of you are probably saying, well, I already share my work online, right? Um, you know, and since the early days of the internet, scholars you know, have done that, shared their work online. Um, but the longevity of the content is dependent upon the format of the item, right? Um, and where it's posted. Um, so today we still see this with social networking sites such as academia.edu or ResearchGate. I get a lot of questions about those. Um, but it's important to remember that these are commercial companies with commercial interests. That's not bad, right? But it does raise some questions around, you know, how do those align with your interests? Um, so I find it easiest to do kind of a side-by-side -side in talking about academia.edu um, versus academic works. Um, both are going to provide increased discoverability and download rates. Um, academia.edu does not provide public access. You have to be logged in with um, Google, Facebook, or academia.edu. So, um, you know, users or readers are paying with their data. Um, they, you know, they don't provide privacy protection, um, they don't provide copyright protection, and increasingly, and there's a bill that's looking to solidify it to be signed next week, um, uh, you know, folks sometimes think that they're meeting, or I should say, increasingly funders, including the federal government, require that if your work is funded by them, that it is publicly accessible. And, um, uh, and Academic Works can support you in accomplishing that, um, but if you submit to academia.edu, it does not. So Megan, yeah. there's another yeah. there's another question from um, Patrick. He right. wanted to know if there's an increase in academic sharing beyond traditional papers, so such as video or other media. Yeah, I mean, so with the um, advent of the internet, there is really, there, there aren't the same limitations that we experienced in a textual environment. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people experiment with different types of research outputs. 
Um, and all of those research outputs, if you have a stable file, um, we can take it into the repository and, um, and support you to distribute it. Um, so my background prior, prior, prior to my life as a librarian, uh, I was a dance historian, I was working in the performing arts. Um, and this is an area where, you know, there's a question of like, how do we preserve the choreo choreographic work, right? Um, it is certainly intellectual output. Um, and so yes, like videos can come in. Um, uh, your artist statement for a show at a gallery can come in, right? And all of those different types of content. Thank you for your question. Um, so in thinking a little bit about this privacy, copyright, preservation, right? I'm not just interested in those things because uh, I'm a librarian. I'm interested in those things because it's really about, you know, supporting you. Um, research can easily be lost or misplaced. Students graduate, we all eventually move on, right, in some way. Um, but as a service of CUNY Libraries, Academic Works ensures that your work is safely stored for the long term, right? So we often think that we're backing up our work on academia.edu or ResearchGate, but these aren't repositories. So when the publisher sent academia.edu um, a massive take it down notice, as Elsevier did, um, they just took all the content down without telling anyone. If Elsevier sends us a takedown notice, we're there to support you and to negotiate on your behalf. There are also some questions around copyright protections. Um, we use legal agreements that protect your rights to your work um, as opposed to academia.edu, which not only reserves the right to sell your work, but holds you liable in case of a lawsuit. It's scary stuff. Um, and then a few years ago, something interesting happened. Um, Academia.edu started moving into new areas. Um, this is now common practice. Um, it sent an email out to all of its account holders, inviting them to pay for an upgrade to see the names of people who are looking at your papers. Now, for some researchers, uh, this could be a value add, right? Um, certainly, if you notice someone reading your work, it's conceivable you could reach out to them, maybe start a conversation. Um, for others, this is an infringement of basic privacy rights. Um, you know, or as um, Michael Oman Reagan, uh, who is uh, a faculty, an anthropologist at Memorial University of Newfoundland, but a Hunter alumnus, most importantly, uh, you know, this is a practice that he described as creepy. Um, but even if you, unlike Michael, uh, are comfortable sharing readership information with your colleagues, you know, there are some questions around who else is academia.edu selling that information to. And so this has led a number of researchers to advocate to a move to alter alternate platforms, right? Um, if not your university's repository like Academic Works, um, one tied to your subject area or scholarly society. Um, now, I would not be so bold as to tell anyone in this room uh, that you should delete academia.edu, um, but I would ask you to consider how it's serving the needs of you and your work. You know, if you want a profile, do you need to upload the file or can you link it to another site? Are there, you know, negotiations that can happen within that space? But of course, we do encourage you to submit to Academic Works. I see hey. Effie has unmuted. Yeah, no, I just, there's a question in the chat, which I'm not quite sure what it means, but what is the copyright line? I'm assuming that maybe it means the copyright protections in CUNY Academic Works. I'm not quite sure what ESC means. Maybe if you want to unmute yourself, am I misunderstanding? I think I, if I understand the question correctly, okay. it might be, um, can you distribute your work in Academic Works without violating the copyright agreement right. that you've signed with the publisher? Is that correct? Give it a moment. I can't see the chat right now, but. Oh, Effie, you're muted. Um, ESC is not responding, but that is a good question. Maybe you could okay. just respond yeah. to it. <laughs> so I'm happy to, I'm happy to address that question. So this, and this is a question that comes up a lot. Um, so typically when, after you've done the work of writing that research article, your peers have done the work of reviewing it, editing it, um, getting it ready for publication, all without compensation. 
um, the publisher asks you to sign a copyright transfer agreement that, you know, essentially takes some or all of your rights to that work. But the good news is that because the open access movement has been around for almost 20 years now, um, because researchers have asked for it, most journal publishers and increasingly many book publishers allow you to share some version of your work in a repository like Academic Works. They're very specific that the repository needs to be nonprofit. Um, sometimes they especially they um, point specifically to it being your university's institutional repository and in the contract language. Um, and so that's where you can upload some works to academic works that you can't upload to commercial sites like academia.edu. Um, if you have a question about your ability to, uh, to put a work in academic works, don't worry. We are not expecting you to be a lawyer in addition to everything else you do. Um, you can email me. Um, or you can email the academic works coordinator at your campus and we can support you to help make a copyright determination. Um, at the very least, um, you can also just in plain language, tell your publisher what you wanna do. If you've already published the work and you know, your contract says you can't submit it to a repository, ask them for permission, right? Um, and they, they will want to support you. So, um, uh, you know, we've, we've had very good success with that. And, um, and I continuously support faculty um, in making those, um, those sort of claims to their own work. So, uh, Megan, Gail is asking, does CUNY Academic Works make any claim on faculty's own copyrights? No, that's a great question. Again, we were developed in service to the faculty. So when you sign um, an agreement, when you submit to Academic Works, you're first asked to sign an agreement and we put it you know, right up in front of the page every time you submit that um, essentially says that you're the copyright owner or have permission of the copyright owner, maybe the publisher um, to distribute your work. And all you do is give CUNY a license to distribute it in Academic Works and any successor initiative. So if the repository gets a different name and different branding, um, we can still distribute it in the repository. But if CUNY wants to do anything else with it, if they want to print it out and publish it as a chapter in a book, I don't know why, but let's say they did, um, they would have to go back and ask for your permission. Um, and so that's really positive, right? The only thing we can do is distribute it in the repository. Um, typically, when you are submitting to academia.edu or ResearchGate, they hide those kinds of things into the terms of use right, as we saw with academia.edu. So it's not as visible. It's also not as researcher friendly. So thank you for that important question. Okay, so really Academic Works is here to support you, to support your work. Once you've submit your work to Academic Works, you can connect it to other places online. Now at many, um, well, at all of the colleges, um, there is the opportunity to create your faculty profile. Um, in some cases, uh, you will only really have the opportunity to provide a brief description of your you know, research area. Um, you'll want at the very least to make sure that you have your email posted so that people know how to get in contact with you um, and to describe your work area. If you have the additional ability to add some of your publications, whether that's all of them or a selected few, um, put a link to Academic Works, right? I upload it there um, and then um, link to the work so that people can not only find your work, they can read it, right? And we'll provide you with a stable URL to do that. But everyone has access to CUNY's very own open source social networking site uh, CUNY Academic Commons. Um, and this is a place where you can create your own profile, right? Um, and this also gets up in some search results. Um, so your name, um, a brief description of what your focus is, you have the opportunity to upload a photograph. Um, and very importantly, again, adding your email so that you can um, find it without someone having to go and, you know, figure out where the faculty directory is for your campus. And when you're creating your account, 
this is really, um, you have the opportunity to decide what information is available to whom. This is one of the reasons I really do love um, academic comments, right? Um, so you can add in information um, with your name and your pronouns, um, a little that little bio that we looked at, um, how to contact you. I've chosen to keep my my phone number. You know, I'm not in the office right now. I get the messages, um, but I've chose to keep my phone number um, private just to logged in members of CUNY Academic Commons. But my email is public to everyone. Um, and if you scroll down, there's also the ability to add information about positions you've held, where you received your degrees, and of course, what you've published. Another place where you can add links to your content in academic works. And then of course, I'd be remiss if we talked about your online scholarly profile without recognizing the um, the elephant that is Google right, and Google Scholar. Um, so Google Scholar provides you with a simple way to search across the scholarly literature. Um, from one place, you can search across many disciplines and sources, right, so articles, theses, books, abstracts, all of them are included. Um, it claims to search all scholarly content, um, and many people assume that if they put their research on the web that it will appear here. Um, and in some cases that's true, but for the most part it's not. Um, like Google proper, no one knows exactly what Google Scholar crawls, um, but it's pretty much limited to content from academic publishers and scholarly societies and university repositories like academic works. Okay, so there are some limited search functions in Google Scholar. Um, but here I've gone in and conducted a search for Shelley Eversley. Um, and we see at the top, there is a direct link to her Google Scholar profile. Um, and we see a list of many of her publications. Now, if I were to click on this publication, The Lunatic's Fancy and the Work of Art, I would be directed to JSTOR and asked to pay $51 for access to the article. Now I can go to my library's website, right? And log in and see if we have access to this particular um, journal. Um, that's definitely a step I can take. Um, but many people stop there at the paywall. But the amazing news is that if you add your work to CUNY Academic Works, Google Scholar will integrate it into their search results. So this PDF coming from cuny.edu is the PDF that is publicly accessible via Academic Works, right? So in this case, right, um, female iconography and invisible man, I can go to the PDF at cuny.edu and this is what I see. The PDF, um, and again, this is how 80% of our users come to the content. Um, and because they're coming to it without seeing the website itself, right? We know that's not gonna win any design awards. Um, we are sure that all of the information that you need to cite the work is included, right? So the title, the author, if you need more information, you can um, you know, go to this link, all of those different elements. And in this case, I'll say, this is a chapter in a book. This is something that would be really difficult to find um, via most discovery layers, whether that's through a library or through Google. Um, but it's that much more visible um, and citable because it's accessible in academic works. Now, in some cases, we conduct a search and we don't see the profile at the top. Um, you know, this makes it a few things, right? It makes it more difficult to distinguish between scholars with the same or similar names, right? So going back to that earlier question, right? It's really important to have that Google Scholar profile. It also means that if the algorithm isn't working in your favor, a user will find some, but not all of your publications, right? So no matter what, you wanna be able to distinguish yourself from the other Patricks of the world. Um, now, the only people who have Google Scholar profiles are those who've created them. So I'm very briefly going to go through, um, with an eye towards the time, um, how to create a Google Scholar profile. Um, there are some key elements to profiles. Um, there is uh, basic information about who you are um, that you can link um, out for more information on your personal website or your faculty profile. Um, you know, just have that direct link to it. 
Um, there is a list of publications which you can sort by a variety of criteria, um, collaborators and author metrics. The author metrics, um, I don't wanna go into this too much. We could actually have a whole other webinar about this, maybe for the 2021, 2022 uh, edition of um, Faculty Funding Fridays. Um, metrics are imperfect. They don't measure value. They're just sort of like um, an automation um, that were originally developed to help librarians make decisions about what books to buy. Um, uh, I will say the H index um, is uh, an author level metric that attempts to measure both productivity and citation impact of the publications of a scholar. Um, the I-10 index um, is something that's specific to Google Scholar, um, but these are all available to you via Google Scholar. Okay, now creating the profile is very easy and depending on how many publications you have will likely take between five and 20 minutes. The first step is to go in and uh, create a profile. Now you have to be logged in. Um, so if you don't have a Gmail account, you can create one um, and then select my profile. Uh, I largely go by Meg Wacha in my life uh, for the past few years, uh, but for professional purposes, I've published under Megan Wacha. So I'm sticking to it. Um, I want all of my work to be connected. If you have changed your name as a result of any number of life transitions, uh, I do want to mention, uh, you know, that for those authors uh, who don't want to or can't use a previous name now or moving forward, that increasingly publishers are developing policies to support authors who want to correct the name of their previous publications. That was very difficult to do, um, but thanks through um, some activism, especially within the transgender community, um, that is increasingly becoming uh, more possible. Um, you're want, gonna want to be sure to verify your profile um, with your CUNY email um, and then link, as I said, to um, other scholarly profiles where you can more, um, where you have a little bit more agency over how your work is represented. You can provide that description of your research interests, et cetera. Um, Google Scholar then does a specialized author search um, on the name you included in your new account. Uh, you'll be able to look over the result, results of that search and claim the works that you actually uh, published or disown the ones that aren't from you. They're from the other uh, people with your name. Uh, this is a really quick and easy way to ingest citations into your Google Scholar profile. Um, and the more you already have online, right, through places like Academic Works, the more citations and links to works you're going to be able to add quickly. Um, but you can also add them manually one at a time. Now, I already have a profile which made this demo a little bit difficult uh, to, to develop. Um, but you can see, um, as I was trying to finagle the system, uh, that it recognized what's already in my profile. Um, and it's recommending some additional content. Now, some of this is from me. Um, uh, and some of it's because I was an editor of an overlay journal, right? And so I can claim or remove publications um, as appropriate. Then um, I'm going to want to tell Google Scholar to either update my profile automatically with citations as they become available, or to send me email notifications when there are new citations and then I can, I can then review it. Because I have a pretty distinctive name, um, I'm okay with Google Scholar automatically updating. But if I you know, was struggling with a common name and you know, finding it difficult to disambiguate with other authors who share it, um, I'm probably gonna wanna conduct that review. And then the most important thing that you can do is make your profile public so that people can actually see it. You do have the option of only making it available to Google and th that can help you a little bit, but not in the same way as making it public. Um, with some finishing touches, add a photo, maybe make sure it's of a higher resolution than the one I have here, um, add whatever unlisted works, um, follow yourself for updates about new citations so that when something is automatically added, you um, are notified um, and, uh, and as people cite you, you are notified um, and then make it public again. I just really want to stress that. Um, so with these steps, um, I very much hope 
um, that they will support you to boost your scholarly profile, especially now when we um, don't have some of the ways of networking, connecting with our peers um, that have been available to us in some previous years. Um, so thanks so much. And uh, if there are any other questions, I am here. There are some. Um, oh, I, I, in the interest of time, I um, stopped interrupting you with the questions, but there actually mm -hmm. are a number of questions great. in chat. And um, so uh, uh, one faculty member has a question about um, uploading unedited versions of published manuscripts to CUNY Academic Works. Um, and uh, she just wants to know, can you do that? And does it depend on the type of copyright transfer agreement? Of can you, so if I understand the question correctly, the question is, can you upload, for instance, like a preprint? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, you can upload a, a preprint, an unpublished manuscript, whether it is on its way to publication or um, it has already been published, or maybe you haven't been able to find a journal venue and you're ready to move on to your next project and you still want to share this work. All of those um, can be shared via CUNY Academic Works. Um, I would just make a couple of caveats. So uh, if you are planning to publish, it can be um, good to check the copyright policies of your journal just to make sure that they allow um, that submission. Um, and again, we're here to support you with that question. Um, I will also note that uh, CUNY Academic Works does permit for an embargo period. So some journals um, require that they have the right of first publication. And, you know, so they basically, they want to get that work out first in your discipline. And uh, so that means that you can submit your work when you're ready to, set an embargo period for a year, six months, whatever, depending on when your work is coming out, you can forget about it. And then once that period of time passes, it will automatically be made publicly available online, right? But in most cases, you know, journals understand that people make those early manuscripts accessible and are and totally permit that. Um, and so uh, we support you in doing so. So there's a question here about, and I think you addressed this a little bit, but um, please compare having work on CUNY Commons website um, and the CUNY Academic Work. So what's the yeah. difference? Or yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so CUNY Academic Commons is a social networking site, um, and you do have the ability to upload and share some works, but it doesn't work with um, uh, some of the different discovery layers in the same way. Um, so CUNY Academic Works specifically feeds the information about any of the works that are submit to it into CUNY Libraries OneSearch, uh, making it more accessible to CUNY folks, um, as well as, you know, we have a direct contact at Google Scholar. Right, and so um, it really makes it um, accessible via Google, Google Scholar now and in the long term. With CUNY Academic Commons, um, and I don't know if there's anyone here on the Academic Commons team, uh, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, one, um, there might uh, it may not be permitted according to your contract, right? Um, it's typically not uh, included. Um, in those copyright transfer agreements. We are very unique in having a social networking site for the university. Um, but also it's not going to be as discoverable and there isn't the same commitment to preservation of that content in the long term, right? Um, so that's something to think about as well. Um, but this is where I think those two things can really work together. So include the citation for your information for your publication on CUNY Academic Commons, but then link to the content in academic works, right? And then that, that uses the best of both worlds, right? Um, people can find it and people can cite it. Uh, great, oh, there's a couple questions, both Frank and Patrick. Um, so Frank wants to know if I put my book on CUNY Academic Works, can students access them on online in order to save money when book, oh my gosh, when money, when books are used as text in the courses? Yes, and we actually often hear from students um, at CUNY and from, you know, institutions all over the world who are using content in CUNY Academic Works as a part of, you know, their educational life. 
Um, I will also say that we also hear directly from faculty at other institutions, and we see it in the downloads as well, that find books in academic works, um, whether it's a chapter or the full text, um, and integrate it into their course materials um, you know, with the appropriate attributions and all of that, of course, uh, to alleviate textbook costs for their students. You could also um, give a little bit of a shout out here to your colleagues that are working on open educational resources, because mm -hmm. I know that you work closely with Ann Fiddler and Andy in the central office and also all the libraries on the OER initiative. But um, the OER initiative is very closely linked to the work that you're doing with academic works too. Yeah, totally. Um, all OERs, you know, OERs um, are distributed via CUNY Academic Works. Um, there's also this really beautiful thing that happens when open research begins to double as an open educational resource. And we really see that happening um, with more and more frequency. Great. Uh, so Elizabeth wants to know, she said, my book came out right before the pandemic hit and thus had less of an impact than I'd hoped. How can I promote it as a specific publication versus my overall profile? Ah, that's a great question. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations on the publication of your book. Um, I, I'm sorry that it had less of an impact that you hoped. I think that's a shared experience uh, for many that came out during that time. Um, in terms of promoting it as a specific publication, uh, this is where, I mean, there are certainly things that you can do um, in terms of tweeting about it. Uh, sometimes it can be helpful uh, to work with your communications team at your campus. Um, make sure, depending on your discipline, uh, maybe it has things that are of interest to journalists that may wish to write about it, um, or um, they can write about it in publicly accessible language so that more people can find it. Um, but really one of the best things you can do is to choose to share um, you know, if you can't do the whole thing, a portion of the book, perhaps a chapter in CUNY Academic Works. Um, as I said before, publishers increasingly permit this, um, especially academic publishers, uh, university presses, um, because when your work can be read more, when that chapter is available, it's actually shown an increase in book sales. Um, so they really do support it. And I'm happy to work with you on that, Elizabeth, if you'd like to send me an email. muted myself because they're drilling in the background. Um, so I, I believe you addressed this a little bit earlier, but um, James wants to know if there are any special considerations for faculty that work with digital artifacts, that is non-textual materials. Uh, to add to what I said earlier, so CUNY Academic Works accepts all types of stable files. Um, you know, sometimes it could become a little bit more difficult when you're working with multimodal content um, so perhaps you have a website that is, you know, users are interacting with in a particular way. Um, and that content would be more difficult to bring in and preserve. But this is where I would recommend that if you have these digital artifacts to reach out to your library about some possible um, preservation realms. Um, there is, for instance, the Internet Archive, where at the very least you can take a little digital snapshot of the work. Um, it may not capture all of the interactive elements, um, but be able to preserve it, um, you know, at least in some way. Um, your colleague Polly Thistlethwaite just made a comment that um, I made a contract with Policy Press to publish a manuscript version of a book without the publisher's formatting. After one year on the market, sales usually drop and then the open publishing gives it extended life. So that's just um, uh, further support of the open access mm -hmm. uh, platform. So there's a question, uh, Patrick, is there a low cost equivalent of, of a press release for books and research? Hmm. I mean, it really depends on the publisher that you're working with and what support they provide to you. Um, so I think that that's actually, so I'm not aware of, for instance, like a low cost equivalent that's going to do the same things for you that a press release would, uh, and especially depending on, you know, what that communications team does with that press release. Um, but I think that those can be really important discussions to have. Um, one with your local communications team at your campus, but also when you're looking at a book publisher, right, to ask them, 
what sorts of so support they provide in terms of um, uh, putting your book out into the world so that people can find it, read it, um, you know, and I'll also it. put in a plug. We, we yeah. regularly promote um, recent publications. We have a, mm -hmm. uh, an office of research newsletter called Lab Meeting, which is searchable and you're welcome to, we, we love finding out about all faculty publications, books, articles, grants, everything. And also I'll give a shout out. I think some is still live, isn't it? Isn't the some newsletter that the Graduate Center puts out, isn't that still live? And they do a great job of profiling faculty members' recent work. So there definitely are uh, resources within CUNY that will help you promote your book. If you reach out both at your college and also at, at the Grad Center and to us at the Office of Research, we can help you put, put you in touch with those. Oh, some has been shuttered, Jill. I thought that, oh, anyway, I'm sorry, that's another question. Yeah. <laughs> Conversation. <laughs> I, thought that they had, I thought that they had given been given a second life, but I guess not. Um, but we'll still help you promote your work. Um, it looks like those are all the questions. Beautiful. Um, and we actually, it's 101, so we are one minute over time. But thank you so much, Meg. And again, if you, you can reach out to Meg directly, you can reach out to us. And thank you so much for all of you for attending. I hope this was uh, useful and, and, and interesting. And um, have a wonderful summer. And we'll see you next year. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you.